The title of today's talk is Too Many to Count, The Role of Fascial Plane Blocks in Regional Anesthesia Practice. I have no financial disclosures. And the reason why this topic is very relevant today is because of the explosion of new regional anesthesia techniques, particularly those that involve injections in various fascial planes throughout the body. If you want to start with a basic foundation, I'd refer you to this particular article by Professor Chin and colleagues published in Regional Anesthesia and Pain Medicine, The Essentials of Our Current Understanding of Abdominal Wall Blocks. Although this article was just published about five years ago, it's already outdated because there have been so many more new techniques involving fascial plane blocks that have come out even in the last five years. If you look at the, this number of new publications, um, this is actually a figure from an editorial that we published in the journal Anesthesia um, back in 2020. And you can see how hundreds of articles in the last couple of years have been published just with the, the term plane block in the title. So I think it's safe to say that these types of techniques are going to be here to stay. Um, and I think it really behooves us to learn a little bit more about what these techniques involve, you know, what they have to offer, um, and ideally how we incorporate them into clinical practice. One of our you know, great pioneers in ultrasound guided regional anesthesia and a mentor to many of us uh, involved in regional anesthesia today is Professor Vincent Chan uh, from the University of Toronto. And one of his quotes you know, that um, is often well cited is that fascial plane blocks work 100% of the time in 50% of patients. Um, and I think this is a, a astute observation uh, from Professor Chan because I think that we all know that um, these particular techniques work differently than our traditional peripheral nerve and plexus blocks in that they don't have discrete neural targets um, in most cases. It's injection of local anesthetic or dilute local anesthetic solution with adjuvants into a plane between two muscular layers in most respects. Um, and, the, and there's a dependence on the spread of that injectate you know, to ideally bathe small peripheral branch nerves you know, that may provide um, analgesia um, and perhaps muscle relaxation. So if we look at you know, some of the, the details in terms of uh, fascial plane blocks, I think it's important to go back you know, to what we consider uh, basic anatomy. And I think that the the basis of regional anesthesia really is um, a working knowledge of anatomy. And if we look at the fascia, uh, the fascia themselves, I think it's important to really understand that we're not really talking about one homogeneous layer. In the thoracolumbar region, which is where we tend to do our transverses abdominis plane blocks and many of the other blocks of the abdominal wall, you know, that middle, middle thoracolumbar layer of fascia that we usually describe as being a single layer under ultrasound, um, we realize is actually three sublayers, um, and this is just the limitation of our bedside ultrasound technology is that we cannot uh, typically uh, make out you know, these, these very, very small um, and distinct sublayers. But it's true that while we, we think that we understand how fascial plane blocks work, we really don't know how they work because you know, we don't even know if there's a specific sublayer you know, that may be optimal um, that may actually um, be more effective than injections within other sublayers. So I think that there's still a lot to be learned about how fascial plane blocks work. Um, and in the future, our knowledge and application of these blocks may evolve. I think because of the, the vast new array of blocks that we have in this particular domain, um, it's important that we, we reset um, you know, the, the ways that we teach and the ways that we research um, this particular type of regional anesthesia, which is why this collaborative project was so important. Um, this was just published last year. This is a, a project that was um, performed in collaboration between the American Society of Regional Anesthesia and Pain Medicine, as well as the European Society of Regional Anesthesia and Pain Therapy to come up with standard nomenclature for these types of blocks, because so many of them um, had, had derived from particular groups of investigators, you know, some of which um, had various names you know, that uh, may have been uh, monikers, you know, named after investigators, you know, or, uh, or clever acronyms um, that may not have necessarily uh, described you know, the anatomic location of injectate. And so you know, this new uh, document, which I refer you to, is really now the standard you know, for naming and describing these blocks, which I think is really important for teaching um, and also researching in a consistent fashion. So before we get into how exactly to apply these blocks, I feel like we should cover two main topics. 
um, what are some of the basics that we know about fascial plane blocks going back to uh, really the, um, the origin of their use um, in regional anesthesia and analgesia? And then how do we look at new techniques um, and decide what we do with them in terms of uh, applying them in clinical practice? And that means look, not only looking at the evidence basis for them, but also trying to decide whether or not it makes sense to change our current clinical practice. If we look specifically at the basics um, I think it's important that we go back um, you know, to this core article, which I mentioned. Um, this is really um, an important document to understand because um, every few years, uh, the American Society of Regional Anesthesia and Pain Medicine publishes these updated essentials articles in its journal, Regional Anesthesia and Pain Medicine. And these really form um, the, the basis of understanding, um, at least up until that time of publication, um, and allows you know, for, you know, for clinicians as well as uh, educators and researchers you know, to really um, you know, update you know, their knowledge and, and start from the same, you know, same, um, you know, same starting point when it comes to uh, the evidence to date. So when we look at um, you know, this type of um, the incorporation of fascial plane blocks um, into clinical practice, I think it's really important to decide you know, how, uh, how this really pertains to general anesthesia practice. Um, and this is an important project that actually came up um, in a recent Delphi study that involved international experts who looked at um, what a non-fellowship regional anesthesia training um, curriculum would look like. And if you look at the list under table three, you see that abdominal fascial plane blocks, um, as well as thoracic fascial plane blocks, are actually included in the recommended types of procedures that non-fellowship um, regional anesthesia practitioners you know, or general anesthesiologists really should learn. And so I think before going into practice, you know, any uh, anesthesiologist in training should try to um, understand and learn at least you know, one or two applications of these fascial plane blocks before they go into practice. And I think if we were to start with a very basic type of technique, uh, for fascial plane blocks um, in clinical practice, we have to look at the transversus abdominis plane or TAP block. Um, this is really the one um, that has been around the longest in cl clinical practice um, and has been shown, at least in simulation studies, to be relatively easy to learn. Um, in this simulation study that was published in you know, it's a journal of uh, surgical simulation. I think what's really important to look at um, is how quickly someone can identify the important fascial plane uh, layers of, for the tap block, as well as perform these blocks. And so if you can learn a particular technique in four attempts and then perform bilateral blocks, at least in a simulated model, um, in six minutes or less, including seven time, then this is something that, um, that, that every anesthesiologist potentially can learn and also incorporate into clinical practice, which means that more patients may have access to this type of um, pain control for surgery. If you discuss the types of tap blocks, there's really not just one. And in the new nomenclature, it really divides up into mid-axillary and subcostal tap blocks. The mid-axillary tap block is performed at the mid-axillary line with the patient supine, uh, although the patient can also be positioned lateral. Um, this uh, sonoanatomic um, you know, image you know, shows that you have three layers of the abdominal wall muscles, you know, which can be easily identified as external oblique, internal oblique, and transversus abdominis you know, from superficial to deep. And you can see in the image the injection of local anesthetic within the tap, which is the transversus abdominal abdominus plane, which is, sits in between the internal oblique and the transversus abdominus muscles. It can be performed, performed in plane or out of plane. In this case, you see the needle in plane with the needle tip clearly identified uh, within that, um, that, that bath of local anesthetic. The mid-axillary tap block, when performed at this level, you know, tends to have some spread anteriorly and posteriorly, as well as cephalad and caudad. Um, this is a nice image you know, from John McDonald's group um, using CT. And you can see the spread of injectate. Um, and this particular technique uh, used by the group uh, published in 2007, this was actually performed as a blind approach without ultrasound. If we look at the subcostal tap, the subcostal tap is actually performed um, more cephalad than the mid-axillary tap and more anterior on the abdominal wall. And you can see the differences in the cadaver dissection here on the left side. Um, you can see that yeah, the, the right-sided injection on the cadaver is a subcostal tap where you can see spread of dye along the costal margin. If you look at the left side of the cadaver um, on the right side of the image, you can see the dye that's much more 
um, much more distal and laterally displaced. And this is the mid-axillary tap distribution. So the advantage of the subcostal tap is that it does provide uh, injectate spread you know, to this upper abdominal wall um, you know, portion, which is innervated by the termination of the intercostal nerves, um, you know, seven, eight, and nine in particular, which is important if for upper abdominal wall surgery. If we look at the data for the tap lock, and we have more data for the tap lock than any other uh, fascial plane block to date, um, at least for colorectal surgery, looking at this uh, published meta-analysis, we can see that the tap lock is associated with significantly reduced opioid consumption after surgery, at least up until the first day. And these are single injection techniques, you know, primarily using local anesthetic alone. And I think that's actually very important because you know, there are many ways to perform a tap lock. And as I already mentioned, you know, there are blind techniques, there are ultrasound guided techniques. Um, and the fact that uh, you can get consistent um, reduction of opioids you know, for the first post-operative day, uh, which falls well within the duration of action of local anesthetic, um, you know, actually is a, a fairly powerful result. In another meta-analysis, you know, looking at you know, patients who have abdominal wall surgery and receive tap locks, you can see that there is a reduction in pain scores as well as opioid consumption. The opioid consumption, again, is reduced for the first 24 hours after surgery. Um, if patients, in this case, you know, also receive intrathecal morphine, for example, for cesarean delivery, then it seems that the intrathecal morphine may have greater analgesic efficacy. But in the absence of intrathecal morphine, you have this consistent reduction of opioids for the first 24 hours when patients receive a tap lock. So this is fairly uh, consistent evidence with the other um, meta-analysis that I reported. If you look at the continuous transversus abdominis plane block technique, so this is repeated injection or continuous infusion of local anesthetic, and you compare it to epidural analgesia after abdominal surgery, I think it's interesting to see that there are no detected differences um, between epidural analgesic um, you know, techniques and the tap lock you know, when performed as a continuous um, technique. And I think this is important as well. This is not to say that um, they are necessarily the same, or that if for major open abdominal surgery, uh, thoracic epidural would not be a preferred technique. But it does offer the potential option of having a regional analgesic approach um, when perhaps epidural analgesia is either not feasible or not preferred. And so that is, it's helpful to be able to offer a positive uh, alternative in terms of regional analgesia for patients as opposed to epidural or nothing. When we look at the tap lock, I think that the detractors of the tap lock will argue that you know, the consistency in terms of sensory coverage um, is highly variable. And this is an important study you know, that was published um, in Regional Anesthesia and Pain Medicine in volunteers who received tap locks. And you can see from the, the sketched out schematic of where these, uh, these particular volunteers reported uh, differences in sensation, that there's a pretty wide range in terms of where there's sensory, uh, sensory deficits exist when, when all of these people receive uh, tap locks. And you could argue, well, what does that mean in terms of analgesia? Considering the fact that um, yeah, this, this is presumably the case in all of those patients who also received um, yeah, tap locks yeah, for you know, the, the studies that I've already reported, the fact that, yeah, that you have this, this high variability in cutaneous distribution, yet consistent reduction in opioid consumption for the first 24 hours may not make sense at first. But if you look at uh, some of the details and the results of this study, what was really interesting to me is that you know, while the sensory coverage may be highly inconsistent, what you do see is a consistent and significant muscle relaxing effect of the lateral abdominal wall in all the volunteers. And it's possible and maybe even probable that muscle relaxation may be part of the pain relieving effects. And this may be what we see in clinical trials, you know, that, that just assessing the sensory deficits from the tap lock may actually understate the value of this technique in terms of analgesia. And I think this um, review that came out from Professor Chin and colleagues, so it was published last year in Regional Anesthesia and Pain Medicine, um, is actually a really important one. And if you look at this particular table, table one, um, it discusses what we currently know and what we currently don't know about the mechanisms of action of fascial plane blocks. And I think this really just gives us an idea um, yeah, even 
just at first glance, that what we know and don't know is almost evenly balanced. You know, there are many unanswered questions when it comes to fascial plane blocks. Um, we also, many of the studies that were, that have involved cadavers. And so we don't necessarily know how much of those data translate to living subjects. We don't necessarily know yeah, the determinants of local anesthetic spread within fascial planes. Uh, there may be many factors, you know, that not the least of which um, may involve um, you know, organ location, um, spontaneous ventilation versus controlled ventilation, um, the whether or not patients are ambulatory immediately after surgery. Um, we also don't know the, um, the exact influence of volume and concentration and mass of local anesthetics, as well as the effect of um, adjuvants um, yeah, and also the potential role um, and various regimens for continuous techniques. And so when we looked at this um, yeah, as a, in writing an editorial about a published study where we looked at yeah, um, a study from Rush University where they had actually added tap lock yeah, to an existing multimodal uh, protocol, uh, what we found was actually fairly interesting. Yeah, the, before the incorporation of tap lock, um, yeah, this particular university had a protocol in which all patients who had um, gastric surgery had local infiltration by the surgeon plus um, a pretty robust multimodal protocol involving dexamethasone, ketamine, acetaminophen, as well as opioids. And what was interesting is when they added the tap lock on top of this you know, very um, robust regimen, they actually found improvements of opio opioid reduction in the range of about you know, nine to 11%, which they actually argued um, you know, was not clinically meaningful. You know, but the way that you know, Dr. Lang and I interpreted the data, um, this is actually remarkable, I think, the fact that um, they still saw improvements in opioid reduction, despite the fact that their multimodal regimen was actually um, probably the, one of the better protocols we've ever seen. So you know, the fact that you can add a tap block to this and still see benefits at all is actually um, something that we really should consider in terms of the role of tap blocks or fascial plane blocks in general. So what do we do with these new techniques? And I think that there are many of them, as I've already mentioned. If we look at the quadratus lumborum block, and this is probably um, you know, one that has uh, the, the next uh, most uh, body of, or next highest body of evidence. Um, we see that these approaches have evolved over time and they tend to be centered around um, the quadratus lumborum muscle anatomically. So there are three techniques you know, now used in common nomenclature. There's a posterior approach, a lateral approach, um, and an anterior quadratus lumborum block. The erector spiny plane block is one that is very popular. It had only started since 2016, but there have been hundreds of articles published about the erector spiny plane block for a wide variety of indications. If you look at the numbers of letters, case reports, and case series. If you look at the, the cadaver studies that have evaluated the erector spiny plane block, it tends to be primarily a dorsal ramus block. And so you know, that differs from a paravertebral block in the sense that the paravertebral block, which is a much a slightly anteriorly placed local anesthetic injection, uh, which is, it puts the local anesthetic deposit into the paravertebral space, which is extra pleural and anterior to the superior costa transverse ligament in the thoracic region, and is considered a true a spinal nerve root block. The erector spinae plane block, it you know, tends to uh, target primarily the dorsal rami, which exit the paravertebral space. And you can see in these cadaver studies, which are similar to other cadaver studies, the ventral rami you know, are actually spared. When we look at the, the cutaneous distribution of the erector spinae plane block, you know, this is actually a similar study to the one I reported before with fewer volunteers, but you see that there's a lot of variability in terms of you know, the distribution of sensory change. And these are for T5 erector spinae plane blocks. You can see that most of the, the sensory change is restricted to the posterior region and slightly lateral region, which really argues you know, that the erector spinae plane block may have limited um, applications on, for anterior types of surgery. So clearly it's not for everything, at least if we look at the cutaneous distributions, although the mechanisms may vary. And I think what we've seen, and this is a study that we did, um, you know, just looking at the amount of Twitter activity and publications related to the erector spinae plane block, we know that there was a lot of discussion about the erector spinae plane block on social media, particularly the Twitter platform, after the initial description of the erector spinae plane block uh, 
in August of 2016. And you can see a rapid rise in the types of publications. Specifically, if you look at you know, the numbers of case reports here in panel three and letters to the editor in panel four, you see that the rise in this pink line of case reports you know, tended to be fairly high and rapid in the initial you know, several months. And that corresponded you know, with, or at least it correlated with an increase in tweets and retweets you know, about these particular, um, you know, these particular studies. If you actually look at panel two, which shows the randomized clinical trials, yeah, there is a lag because yeah, RCTs take longer to perform. And you see how the increase in RCTs just in the last you know, year you know, to two years you know, really has corresponded to a decline overall in the tweets and retweets, although they are on the rise again. And when you look at the conversations around the erector spinae plane block, they tend to be dominated by particular accounts. Although the discussions about erector spiny plane block on Twitter really are worldwide, and you see the number of unique accounts, over 1,500 accounts, have tweeted about the erector spiny plane block. So it does, um, it does suggest that there is a lot of conversation about this particular block, um, and it does beg the question, you know, why is there such demand, or why is there so much active discussion about a block that um, is relatively new, you know, only described in 2016? And I think part of the reason why that we have this is that, um, you know, that while we have a gold standard, what we consider a gold standard in terms of unilateral uh, chest wall blocks in the paravertebral block, it is associated with serious risk, which in particular, the risk of pneumothorax. And so I think that while this, that block has been around for over five decades, um, there is a, you know, a limitation in terms of uptake in the sense that you know, the anesthesiologist who doesn't necessarily feel comfortable or skilled in regional anesthesia may be more reluctant to attempt paravertebral block, while erector spinae plane block, which tends to be more posteriorly placed um, and injects local anesthetic posterior to the transverse processes, may be more attractive you know, to anesthesiologists who don't feel confident in their regional anesthesia skills to attempt paravertebral block. The truth is, we have a lot of different blocks for chest wall, and sometimes this makes it feel overly complicated. You can see we have now for chest wall blocks alone, and this, this is actually an outdated figure now as well, um, yeah, from my friend um, and Amit Pawa and his colleague Ann Barron. But you see that we have pector inter intercostal fascial plane blocks, we have PEX1, PEX2, we have um, serratus plane blocks, you know, we also have substratus plane and rhomboid intercostal blocks, um, in addition to the erector spinae plane um, and paravertebral. And yeah, I think that these options you know, sometimes are intimidating. And so it makes you wonder whether you know, these, you know, what the role is for, you know, for many of these blocks um, in clinical practice, especially if um, you know, many uh, anesthesiologists feel reluctant to try um, you know, some of these new blocks until they see better data. This particular block is a relatively new one and just was just published recently um, you know, with uh, myself and some colleagues. And it's called the external, uh, external oblique intercostal block. Um, and it also targets the upper abdominal wall. And one of the challenges uh, with the subcostal tap block, which has already been described for upper abdom abdominal wall analgesia, is that, you know, that sometimes that upper abdominal wall layer is disrupted. So for example, you know, with either um, you know, for transplant surgery, major open abdominal surgery, open cholecystectomy, um, that upper abdominal wall region you know, that's targeted by the subcostal tap um, you know, may be disrupted. And so there may not be fascial continuity for the distribution of local. With the external oblique intercostal block, you actually inject local anesthetic over the rib cage or over the lower costal margin. And so this injection of local anesthetic occurs between the external oblique layer of muscle and the intercostal muscles, and, and actually um, approximates a similar distribution of local anesthetic um, and sensory coverage in that upper abdominal wall layer. And so we've performed this ourselves, and this particular paper describes the technique um, in, in much more detail, um, as well as the various types of indications where it may make sense. So if we're looking specifically at how to approach new blocks, um, I think that it's not as simple as you know, reading about it and then deciding, well, I'm just going to try that and see if it makes sense. Um, some of our colleagues you know, got together and we actually talked about trying to use more pragmatic criteria to evaluate these new te techniques in regional anesthesia and acute pain medicine. And the criteria we used you know, are uh, similar categories than what's used you know, to evaluate health systems. And if you actually are, if you're familiar with the Commonwealth Fund, 
that uh, commonly reports uh, the status of health systems against each other. And this is usually, these are the reports that usually um, show that the United States sp spends more money uh, per capita on healthcare, but ranks the lowest out of all developed nations in terms of outcomes. Uh, these are the types of criteria they look at. They look at improving outcomes. They look at efficiency. In this case, in clinical practice, we try to think about enhancing um, clinical practice efficiency. They look at increasing access as well as decreasing disparities. So that way we have equitable healthcare. And I think if we applied those four different categories to evaluating any new block or technique in regional anesthesia and acute pain medicine, I think we may come up with interesting answers. Um, and what that could look like in, in uh, practical application could be a point system. So if each of these categories had a particular number of points that add up to 100, so in this case, um, and this may differ based on the, based on the practice. So you may um, apply a different number of points for these categories, depending on what your practice thinks is important. But let's say efficiency had a total of 25 points possible, access was 15 points possible, outcomes was 50 points, and disparities or decreasing disparities was worth 10 points. Then if you were to compare techniques head to head, then you would end up with um, point categories um, and a total score that would allow you in your uh, using these pragmatic criteria to compare one block to another block. Um, so try this for yourselves. Think about how you would compare paravertebral block to the erector spinae plane block, or how you'd compare a quadratus lumborum block, the anterior quadratus lumborum block to a tap block, and see how they compare. Um, and try to be honest in terms of yeah, how you would score those, um, those particular categories, and then use those criteria to decide whether you want to try something new or not. So in summary, we talked about fascial plane blocks, and there are too many to count these days. Um, I think it is important to go back to basics, talk first about anatomy. And then when you're trying to look at new techniques, I think it's important to evaluate many of these new techniques based on pragmatic criteria. And hopefully what we've talked about will be helpful in terms of trying to interpret the literature and then decide how you change your clinical practice. Thank you for joining.